In this web security course, you will learn all about DevSecOps from me, Bo Carnes. You will learn how to take advantage of common web vulnerabilities, how to fix those vulnerabilities, and how to use DevSecOps tools to make sure your applications are secure. Toward the end, Eric Smalling from Sneak will talk about securing containers and more about DevSecOps. Soon I'll be showing you how to implement common hacking techniques, but first I'll give an overview of DevSecOps. DevSecOps refers to the integration of security practices into a DevOps software delivery model. In a DevSecOps model, security objectives are integrated as early as possible in the lifecycle of software development, and security considerations are important throughout the lifecycle. Later, I'll be going into more details about what this actually means in practice. But first, to really understand DevSecOps, it can be helpful to first understand DevOps and also vulnerabilities. Thanks to Sneak for sponsoring this course. Their resources made this possible. Let's start with vulnerabilities. The whole point of security is to protect against vulnerabilities, so let's understand the different types, and afterwards, I'll discuss DevOps. The average cost of a data breach in 2020 was $3.86 million, and global cybercrime costs are expected to reach $6 trillion by the end of this year. It is estimated that 90% of web applications are vulnerable to hacking, and 68% of those are vulnerable to the breach of sensitive data. In 2020, there were over 1,000 data breaches in the United States, according to the Identity Theft Resource Center and over 155.8 million individuals were affected by data exposures. When thinking about security, it is important to understand the difference between a vulnerability, an exploit, and a threat. A security vulnerability is a software code flaw or a system misconfiguration that hackers can use to gain unauthorized access to a system or network. Once inside, the attackers can leverage authorizations and privileges to compromise systems and assets. An exploit is the method hackers use to exploit a vulnerability. An exploit is typically a piece of custom software or a sequence of commands. There are even exploit kits that can be embedded in compromised web pages where they continuously scan for vulnerabilities. As soon as a weakness is detected, the kit immediately attempts to deploy an exploit, such as injecting malware into the host system. A threat is the actual or hypothetical event in which one or more exploits use a vulnerability to mount an attack. Only a small amount of known vulnerabilities will be used to hack into a system. Vulnerabilities that pose the highest risk are those that have a higher chance of being exploited, and therefore should be the ones that are prioritized. Security vulnerabilities can be found in all different areas related to software. Here are some common security vulnerabilities in applications and websites. There are two different important lists of weaknesses in web applications. The first list is created by the Open Web Application Security Project, or OWASP. They have a popular list called the OWASP Top 10 that features the most commonly exploited vulnerabilities. The second list is CWE, or Common Weakness Enumeration, which is a community-developed list of common software and hardware weakness types that have security ramifications. This list is run by the MITRE, or MITRE Corporation, which is a not-for-profit company that operates federal government-funded R&D centers. They create the CWE25, which is their list of the 25 most dangerous software weaknesses. In the CWE25, there are three major types of application and website security weaknesses. There's porous defenses, risky resource management, and insecure interaction between components. A porous defenses weakness is one that could allow users to bypass or spoof authentication and authorization processes. Authentication verifies the identity of someone trying to access a system, while 
authorization is the set of access and usage permissions assigned to the user. Porous defense weakness examples include weak password encoding, insufficiently protected credentials, missing or single-factor authentication, insecurely inherited permissions, or sessions that don't expire in a timely manner. All of these porous defense vulnerability types can allow hackers to successfully access sensitive resources. Exploits that leverage these vulnerabilities may include credential stuffing attacks, hijacking of session IDs, stealing login credentials, or man-in-the-middle attacks. The next vulnerable category is risky management of resources such as memory, functions, and open source frameworks. The types of vulnerabilities in this category are out-of-bound read-or-write, which is the same as buffer overflow. Uh, the application can be tricked into writing or reading data past the end or before the beginning of the intended memory buffer. Also, path traversal. This allows attackers to get to path names that let them access files out of restricted directories. I'll be showing an example of this later. Exploiting these vulnerabilities allow hackers to gain control over an application, or damage files, or even access sensitive information. And then the final major weakness area is insecure interaction between components. Many applications today send and receive data across a wide range of services, threads, and processes. The way different components interact with, with each other can introduce vulnerabilities. Weaknesses that expose a web application or website in this manner can include cross-site scripting. This is when user inputs are not handled securely. It can open up the possibility for cross-site scripting attacks that enable attackers to inject client-side scripts into web pages viewed by other users. This is a very common vulnerability. There's also cross-site request forgery. This is improper verification of whether a seemingly legitimate and authentic request was intentionally sent. These attacks are often mounted via social engineering vectors such as bogus emails that trick a user to click a link, which then sends a forged request to a site or server where the user has already been authenticated. If apps and websites don't properly implement security controls for interaction between components, this leaves them vulnerable to backdoor attacks, scripting attacks, worms, Trojan horses, and other exploits that deploy malicious code to wreak havoc on infrastructure, data, and systems. Between the OS 10 and CWE 25 lists, it is clear that broken access control is the top vulnerability. 94% of applications have some sort of broken access control. Access control makes sure that users cannot act outside of their intended permissions. So if this is not set up properly, it can lead to unauthorized information disclosure or modification or even destruction of data. Now let's talk about DevOps, which is an important part of DevSecOps. DevOps is a concept that has been talked about and written about for a long time and many definitions of DevOps have emerged. DevOps is basically a set of practices that combines software development, the dev, and IT operations, the ops. It aims to shorten the system's development lifecycle and provides continuous delivery with high software availability. So you can see in the DevOps pipeline, it basically goes on infinitely going through all these different steps. Most modern DevOps organizations will depend on some combination of continuous integration and continuous deployment or delivery systems in the form of a CI-CD pipeline. As part of the life cycle, a variety of automated security testing and validation can be performed without requiring the manual work of a human operator. And this is all part of the software development life cycle. Here's an example of a common DevOps flow. First, a developer will write code and push it to a repo. At that point, the CI-CD pipeline starts. There are automated tests, then a version is built that's eventually deployed to production. There are tests at every step to assure code quality. But in this model, security is sometimes only considered right before deploying to production. DevSecOps follows a similar flow but adds automated security considerations throughout the process. Security is integrated with the DevOps. DevSecOps codifies security objectives as part of the overall goal structure. 
The shield represents all the places we test for security. Different tools are used for different steps. And I'll talk some about the specific tools later. DevSecOps should be thought of as the natural continuation of DevOps, rather than as a separate idea or concept. Activities designed to identify and ideally solve security issues are injected early in the life cycle of application development, rather than after a product is released. This is accomplished by enabling development teams to perform many of the security tasks independently within the software development life cycle. To integrate security objectives early in the development of an application, start before the first line of code is ever written. Security can integrate and begin effective threat modeling during the initial concept of the system, application, or even the individual user story. A static analysis, linters, and policy engines can be run anytime a developer checks in code, ensuring that any low-hanging fruit is dealt with before the changes move further upstream. Later, I'll be showing you how to use a tool to check code for security issues while you're writing it. Software composition analysis can be applied to confirm that any open source dependencies have compatible licenses and are free of vulnerabilities. I'll be showing you how to use a tool to check software dependencies for security issues. It can be very helpful to get immediate feedback on the relative security of the code you've written, and this helps individual developers take ownership of security issues. Once code is checked in, Static Application Security Testing, or SAST, tools can be used to identify vulnerabilities and perform software composition analysis. SAST tools should be integrated into post-commit processes to ensure that new code introduced is proactively scanned for vulnerabilities. Having a SAST tool integration in place enables remediation of vulnerabilities early in the software development lifecycle and it reduces application risk and exposure. After the code builds, you can start to employ security integration tests. Running the code in an isolated container sandbox allows for automated testing of things like network calls, input validation, and authorization. These tests are often part of Dynamic Application Scanning Tools, or DAST. These tests generate fast feedback enabling quick iteration and triage of any issues that are identified, causing minimal disruption to the overall stream. If things like unexplained network calls or unsanitized input occur, the tests fail, and the pipeline generates actionable feedback in the form of reporting and notifications to the relevant teams. Next, things like correct logging and access controls can be tested. Does the application log relevant security and performance metrics correctly? Is access limited to the correct subset of individuals or even prevented entirely? Uh, finally, the application makes its way to production. But security tests continue. Automated patching and configuration management ensure the production environment is always running the latest and most secure versions of software dependencies. Special techniques and tools can be used to secure containers. Later, you will learn how to do this in a real-world environment. Using a DevSecOps or CI-CD pipeline helps integrate security objectives at each phase, allowing the rapid delivery to be maintained. The entire approach helps minimize vulnerabilities that reach production, thereby reducing the costs associated with fixing security flaws. DevSecOps aims to build security into every stage of the delivery process and establish a plan for security automation. When thinking about security, you should remember that your code is just the tip of the iceberg. In an average software project, only 10 to 20% of code is custom code. Yes, it is important to make sure your custom code is secure, but there's a lot more to think about. 80 to 90% of many code bases consist of open source code, modules, and libraries. The frameworks and libraries that you import can themselves import more frameworks and libraries. This is code that you didn't actually write yourself. You know, on average, 80% of vulnerabilities are found in direct dependencies. It doesn't matter how good you are at writing secure code if you import vulnerable dependencies. Then there are containers. These often consist of hundreds of Linux packages inherited from public sources. 
again, code that you didn't actually write yourself. And you can't forget about infrastructure as code. This opens up a bunch of new attack vectors for malicious actors. Misconfiguration is the number one cloud vulnerability. DevSecOps properly implemented should cover all of these areas. So it should be becoming obvious, but let's talk more about why DevSecOps practices are important. As companies get larger, there's often more software, cloud technologies, and DevOps methodologies. More software means more of the organization's risk becomes digital, making it increasingly challenging to secure digital assets. Cloud technologies means that many of the IT and infrastructure risks are moved to the cloud. This raises the importance of permission and access management since everything can be accessed from anywhere. As you've seen, DevSecOps brings security into DevOps, enabling development teams to secure what they build at their pace, while also creating greater collaboration between development and security practitioners. Security teams offer expertise and tooling to increase developer autonomy while still providing a level of oversight. So here are six benefits of the DevSecOps model compared to the traditional DevOps model. Faster delivery. The speed of software delivery is improved when security is integrated in the pipeline. Bugs are identified and fixed before deployment, allowing developers to focus on shipping features. Improved security posture. Security is a feature from the design phase onwards. A shared responsibility model ensures security is tightly integrated from building, deploying, to securing production workloads. Reduced costs. Identifying vulnerabilities and bugs before deploying results in an exponential reduction in risk and operational costs. Enhancing the value of DevOps. Improving overall security posture as a culture of shared responsibility is created by the integration of security practices into DevOps. Improving security integration and pace. Cost and time of secure software delivery is reduced through eliminating the need to retrofit security controls post-development. Enabling greater overall business success. Greater trust in the security of developed software and embracing new technologies enables enhanced revenue growth and expanded business offerings. It's about to get practical. I'm going to show you how to exploit some common web app vulnerabilities. And I'm going to show you how to use DevSecOps tools to make sure your software is secure. We're going to learn some hacking techniques as well as learn how to prevent hacking by using this Goof app. This was developed by Sneak and it's a vulnerable demo app. It was created with some common vulnerabilities so we can learn how to hack those vulnerabilities and also even better how to fix those vulnerabilities. So the whole goal is to make sure the apps that you develop do not have vulnerabilities, but we can also use it to figure out how to check for check vulnerabilities in other programs and apps. So let's download this. We're going to, I'm going to copy this. Now I've got my terminal open and I'm just going to clone that project. So git clone and then I'll paste in the link here. So after you clone it, there's two ways to get this running. You can run Mongo on your local machine like this, and then we already cloned it. Then you can do npm install and npm start. There is actually a simpler way to do it, I think, which is to use Docker Compose. You can use either method. I'm going to use Docker Compose. So to install Docker Compose, you can follow the instructions on this website for whatever your operating system is. I'm going to install it on Mac. Okay, I'm just going to copy this, or you can just remember this, Docker Compose up build. Now you can see I'm in the directory, Node.js goof. And then we'll do docker compose up build. Okay, this looks like it's running. Let's check it on our web browser. I'm going to open up a new tab. And it loads the Goof to Do app. 
This is just a simple app. It's not really full featured or anything, but it has enough as part of it that we can test some hacking techniques and then we'll also be able to see how to fix those and how to secure our app so it can't be hacked. So let's just do some tests uh, to do. Let's see, buy milk. Finish tutorial. Eat ice cream. Okay, well this to-do app looks pretty good. Before we start hacking it, I'm going to actually open up the code for the app so we can look at the code. And we'll be going kind of going back and forth between the actual code used to develop this app and the way that we can hack the app. And then we'll go back to the code and see how we can fix the things that are vulnerable. Okay, so just open up the, the Node.js goof directory in any code editor. I'm using VS Code. And if we go into Views, we can see that it's using uh, the EJS extension. And then here's the view we're on right now, where you can create a new item, and it's going to return each of the to-dos here. But you can see there are a few other views here. We have an admin view, account, and then we have index layout. So we are going to start our hacking by trying to get into this admin page. So if I go here and do slash login, we want to figure out how we can log in to this admin access. So a hacker will possibly do some sort of social engineering or some or maybe just searching on websites to find out what the admin username is. It could be admin or in this case it's admin at sneak.io because this was developed by sneak.io. So there's a few ways we could try to figure out how to get into this page but using a, a different tool than just the web browser is going to be helpful. We could use our command line and use curl, or we can do it in a more kind of visual way and use something called Burp Suite. Burp Suite is, is a tool that a lot of penetration testers and hackers use, and Burp Suite has a lot of features that make it easy to test different things about websites and change things and really try to hack different parts of websites. So I'm just going to type in download Burp Suite into Google, and I'm going to download the free community edition for my operating system. Okay, I just opened up Burp Suite for the first time, and I'm just going to click Next to create a temporary project and start Burp. And what we want to do is be able to intercept the HTTP requests that we're sending to the website and change them. We want to modify the requests that are going to the websites, and we can do that by going to the target, you know, going to the proxy tab, intercept, and now we have intercept is on. But to actually intercept the things, we need to intercept the things on a web browser. It's kind of complicated to set it up to use our built-in web browsers like Google Chrome or Firefox, but Burp Suite has an embedded browser that makes it a lot simpler. So we're going to open up this embedded browser. And here's the Burp Suite embedded browser. And I'm going to make sure Intercept is off for now. When it's on, you're going to have to click forward in between each request. But we, we'll do that later, but not quite yet. Now I'm just going to get the URL, localhost 3001. And then I'll paste it into the browser. Okay, great. We can see the website right in the Burp Suite browser. Now I'm going to go over to slash login. Okay, so we're, now they're at this page. I'm going to turn intercept on. And I'll move this over to the side here. And so we'll use the username we already know, which is admin at sneak.io. And then I'll just put anything for the password and then click submit. If we go over here, it hasn't actually, even though I click submit, it hasn't tried to submit it yet. It, it's gonna, it caught this request, it intercepted 
the request right here. So you can see it has the username. It also has the password. I was trying to type wrong, but I spelled it wrong. And we can now change what's sent to the back end. We can change what values are sent to the back end. So at this point, if I just click forward, it's just going to send that those values. Now, I already said that this wasn't a fully complete app. So when you log in incorrect, it doesn't currently have a page that shows you when you log in incorrect. It just says this. So we know we've logged in incorrectly. If we've logged if we logged in to admin correctly, it would actually go to the admin page. But we're going to go back to the login page and turn intercept off. And then I'm going to type that in one more time. And I'm just going to type in a password one more time. I'm going to turn intercept on. We're going to attempt a NoSQL injection. Now, what a hacker would do would be just to try a bunch of different methods. And eventually, they're going to try a NoSQL injection. So this is the method I'm going to show you now. So if we go over here to our request, Right now, the password is a string. We're all passing in strings. But what if the password wasn't a string? What if it was an object? Could an object actually be harmful or considered an issue? Well, let's try. If we're going to be sending an, a, a JSON object, we're going to actually have to change this request a bit. We are going, instead of accepting text, this is now going to be a JSON object. So we're going to change it to application slash JSON star slash star q equals 0 0.5 that's how we're going to accept json objects and then we're also going to have to change the content type so where's that so this is going to become application slash json now we can just pass in instead of this text down here we're going to pass in an object and the object is going to have the username and password Username is going to be the same thing as before, but this time we have to put in strings because this is an object. So this is going to be admin at sneak.io. And then we'll have the password. But remember, we're doing a NoSQL injection. We're not going to pass it a string here. This is going to be an object. And the object is going to go like this. Let me just type it all in really quick. This here, in this NoSQL injection, it's passed in as is to the password property, and it has a specific meaning to MongoDB. It uses this dollar sign GT operation, which stands for greater than. So we, in essence, tell MongoDB to match that username with any record that has a password that is greater than this empty string, which is bound to hit a record. So this is a NoSQL injection vector. So let's try this. I'm going to forward this on. And then we'll forward it one more time. And now you can see we are now in the admin, act, admin access granted. We're now logged in as admin. We're going to do a few more of these. And then we're going to go into the code and see how to fix some of these problems. So there's another URL on this page, once you're logged in, called account details. So since we're logged in, we can get to the account details page. Oh, and let me turn on intercept or turn off intercept so it goes to it quicker. So we can enter these account details. I'm just about to show you a code injection. This is rendered as a handlebars view. Let's see if you uh, if we go back over to this code. So this is a uh, this is created in handlebars. And the same view is used for both the get request, which shows the account details, as well as the form itself for a post request, which updates the account details. So it's, uh, it's basically server-side rendering. So the way the form works is that it receives the profile information and then passes it as is to the template. This means, however, that the attacker is able to control a variable that flows directly from the request into the view template library. Now a hacker isn't going to know all this, but they're going to try a bunch of things to figure out if it just happens to maybe have one of these vulnerabilities. So if you just do it like normal, we can just type in everything. And it's going to, to save the account details to the database. 
So to do this code injection, instead of using burp suite, I'm gonna show you how to do it with curl. Okay, I'm just gonna paste in this line here. This is going to use curl to log into the website using the administrator account. We have the administrator, and now we actually are using the real password, super secret password. Uh, you could also use some of these other methods, the other method we showed before to try to hack in without knowing the password. But in this case, um, I'm showing you a different vulnerability. So we're just gonna use the real password. Just don't tell anybody what it is and we are going to save this cookie to c.txt. That way that we can do another curl command and still be logged in with this administrator cookie. So let me just hit enter here. Okay, so we're logged in to the administrator. It says we're redirecting to slash admin because it logged in correctly. Now I'm just gonna paste in another curl command. So you can see the end of this curl command is the URL we're going to, which is the account details page. This is the one we were just looking at on the web browser. We are doing a post request. We're not trying to get the, the file. We're not trying to get the page. We're trying to send data to the page. And we are going to log in using the c.txt file. This was stored on the computer when we logged in with the administrator here. So we're still the administrator when we do this action. And if you see here, this is the information that's being sent over. So you can see we have fields for every field on that page. We have email, first name, last name, country, phone. So those are all these details on here. But you can see there's one final thing. There's layout. If we pass layout, when we, when we pass it to a template language like Handlebars, this could lead to a local file inclusion or path traversal vulnerability. So let me show you what happens. You can see we do layout and then we have, we pass in the file path to get to a file on the server. So we're gonna see if we can actually get information from the server and yes, it's, it's returning the package.json file. So you could use the same concept to try to return the text of any file on the server. This could include passwords, hash passwords, or any sort of, any sort of data you may be able to figure out by using this, this hack. Now let's look at another vulnerability. We're gonna see this one first right in the code, and then we'll go and try it out in the browser. So I'm on the admin view, and if we go down, we could see that it introduces a redirect page query path. The redirect page is rendered as raw HTML and not properly escaped because it uses this dash instead of it should be an equal sign. So this introduces a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Let me show you how you would take advantage of this vulnerability. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to the normal login page and now I'm going to add a query parameter. It's going to be a redirect page. But instead of adding a normal URL or page that we're going to, I'm going to add some JavaScript. And it works. This alert came up. So we've been able to successfully inject JavaScript code into this page. Okay, I'm gonna show off one more vulnerability and then we'll start looking into how we can find and fix these vulnerabilities. So I'm at the main to do here and I'm just going to try some different things. Like, let's see if we can add Markdown. Hello. Now that I see, oh, I can add Markdown, well, maybe there's something else I can do. Now, uh, there's different libraries that can be used to add Markdown like this. In this case, we're using the Marked library, and a hacker may know that certain libraries have certain vulnerabilities. But even if they don't know about certain vulnerabilities, they may just try a bunch of different things and see what they can figure out. So let's see if we can make a link appear. Okay, we can make it show a link right here. In this case, I was supposed to put HTTP colon slash slash, but you can see it still works here. And now let's see if we can get it to run JavaScript. Let's 
Well, that's good. It's not vulnerable to just typing in JavaScript in there. There may be something else we could try, though. Let's see if we can make another link and just put in some JavaScript right in here. Okay, that didn't work, which is good. But one thing that is common is to represent data in a different way. So, so I got the same one we just typed in, but I'm gonna make a few slight changes. We can actually replace this colon with the HTML entity for a colon. So it's gonna be like this. And then this final parentheses we can represent with the HTML entity. So let's test this. Well, it didn't run the JavaScript, but you can see something different happened. It doesn't look the same as this. So we now know that the sanitation is happening in a different way when we, we put these other symbols here. And like I said, this is using the open source library Markdown. So anybody can just run, just read through that code and they may be able to figure out vulnerabilities just by reading through the code. So the reason why this isn't working yet is because the people who created Marked are actually sanitizing this out and looking for something like this and removing it. However, we can actually take advantage of something that a browser does. A browser actually tries to fix your JavaScript code. So if it sees something wrong, it actually tries to figure out, uh, figure out what you meant. So we can type something like this, like the actual word this here, and the browser is just going to try to try to kind of try to figure out what this means. But the interesting thing is, the marked library, when it's trying to sanitize things, it's not trying. It's not looking for this set of characters. It's only looking for just this set of characters. So if it sees this full set of characters, it's not going to sanitize. It's not going to replace it with anything. But the browser will still be able to try to figure out what this means. So let's just um, put this in here. And now we have a link here. If I click the link, now it's running the JavaScript code. So we're able to send JavaScript code that can run right in someone's browser. And in this to-do app, this could be something that other people could have viewed the to-dos and you could actually make someone run JavaScript code. So this is a cross-site scripting vulnerability right in our application just because of this library that we're using. So let's see if we can go about finding and fixing some of these vulnerabilities. Let's go back into our code editor. There's a program called Sneak Code, which is a static application security testing software, or SAST. And there are plugins for a lot of different IDEs. There's a VS Code plugin that we're going to use right now. So let's install this plugin. This is going to help us find our security vulnerabilities and fix our security vulnerabilities. So I'm just going to search for Sneak, and I'll just install this one, Sneak Vulnerability Scanner, with the 12,000 here. Okay, now that this is installed, we can see a new icon here, the Sneak icon. And it's going to work better. Um, we're going to actually connect it here. Okay, so I got my account created and I'm logged in and I can authenticate. So we're already searching the open source vulnerabilities up here. And then down here, code security and quality, we're going to have to enable it. So click this link and then enable and then save changes. Okay, let me go back over here. And now it's just, it's analyzing the code from this project. This analysis runs automatically whenever you open a folder or a workplace. And then also when you save, it's going to scan the, the code automatically. So we can start clicking into these. So these are our open source dependencies, things that are different packages we have. And then down here is the vulnerabilities in our actual custom code. So I'm going to click one of these issues here, and you can see it's going to go right here. It's going to underline it. It's going to tell you what the, the error is, and then it's going to give you some more information about it. So actually, let's, let's look at this issue in particular. 
So this is for the login. Unsanitized input from the HTTP request body flows into find where it is used in an SQL query. This may result in, in a SQL injection vulnerability. And this was one of the vulnerabilities that we were able to take advantage of. So we now know where the vulnerability is and it's going to over here give us some information about how to fix it. So it's showing here, it's showing some, it says this vulnerability was fixed by 255 projects. Here are three example fixes. This is similar code from other projects showing what people did to fix this mistake. So if we go, we can actually go through these to get different examples of what people did. So we also can get more information about the vulnerability by clicking here, more info, and we can see it's the, the SQL injection vulnerability. So here, with the login handler, it's actually going to take whatever password the user entered, and then it's going to, this user.find is going to pass that everything directly to the backend database for validation. And it's going to pass the exact text that the user entered, or in our case, remember, this is where we pass an object. We were able to pass an object with the, remember the, with the greater than, and this allowed us to log into the administrator account without knowing the password, just by passing in an object. And because this is just passing in whatever the user types in into the database, that's how we were able to do the SQL injection. And it's all because MongoDB uses JSON to query the database. So it's the SQL injection, or in this case, actually a NoSQL injection. So the very absolute simplest way to solve this problem would just be to cast this to a string, the password. Uh, so if someone uh, puts in an object, it will actually, when it be, gets cast to a string, it will look like this. Uh, if you cast an object to a string, it just looks like object, object, which would not, would, which would not be the correct password. Uh, there are, this is like a simplest way, but there, there's much better ways, such as there's different libraries that can help you, and there's different ways that you can, can make sure that this is not a problem. But this was just be like the simplest way to make sure someone cannot pass an object in for the password. So we'll just ignore that, even though there are better ways to fix that. We're going to ignore that because we're going to use this, um, this way to fix this problem. Not only can you see all your code security issues by just clicking here, if we actually go to our file explorer, any file that's read is actually going to be a file that Sneak has found to have security issues. So we can close that, and we can see that it's finding security issues in this file. And these are all things, if I click on here, And then view problem, it's going to show right in here, avoid hard coding values that are meant to be secret. Found a hard coding st hard code string used in the express session. So we're actually, the secret is right in here. You don't want to put a secret right in here. You want to use an environment variable. If we go here, we can click on quick fix and then the show the suggestion. So here are some examples of how people fixed it. This person didn't, they changed the, the secret to just a variable that hasn't been defined yet. Really, you want to use a, like I said, an environment variable to fix a problem like this. So we can actually go through each of these issues in the code security here and then change them one at a time. So here's one we just talked about, about the hard coding, and we have another, the secret token is right in here. So that's how Sneak is going to help us fix our issues. So let's see what this one is. Well, disable X powered by header for your Express app because it exposes information about the, the use framework to potential attackers. And, it, and then it tells you what to use. Consider using helmet middleware. Some of the vulnerabilities that we were able to exploit wasn't even in the code that was written for this app. It was in the open source dependencies. So let's go to this open source security section. And one thing I didn't mention is that these are color coded. So 
if it's in red, that means it's basically one of the worst possible things that could happen you know and then orange is bad but not quite as bad and uh the yellow is the mildest or i guess gray would be the mildest so anything that's red you definitely want to fix one of the issues that we exploited was in handlebars so if we fix the hand if we click handlebars it's showing that we're using handlebars 4.0.14 and it's suggesting to fix this issue, we can upgrade to 4.1.0. And then it's going to go on to show us exactly what the problem that's happened, that, that happened. So the problem related to prototype pollution and then the unsafe object recursive merge. So once I know about this handlebar thing, there's a plenty of things I can do to just kind of upgrade handlebars. So one thing is that I can go right into my package.json, and you see we still have it here, HBS. Now I can actually just change this to 4.1.0, like is recommended. And if I just close some of these here, you can see that it's showing right in our package.json file, it's showing all of these different vulnerabilities. And if I click here, show the most severe vulnerability. Now it's saying for jQuery, I should upgrade to 3.5.0. So I can just type in 3.5.0 to upgrade that. And then we can go through every single one of these and just try to find just try to find all what vul what's vulnerable, but some things we may not want to upgrade, but some things we may want to upgrade, just depending on the severity of the vulnerability and how it's going to impact our app. Another way you can go about doing this is using the command line. So I'll just open up a new terminal down here, and I don't have sneak installed quite yet. You just do npm install sneak at latest. So this I do if you have npm. And now I can just run sneak test. Oh yeah, first I have to authenticate sneak. Sneak auth. Okay, I've authenticated. So before we authenticated for VS Code, now we're authenticating for the command line and then sneak test. And this is going to find all of this, these things. And it's going to, so you, you can find it right in VS Code or we can just use the command line and see all the red things are the high severity. So this is kind of nice to, to find out all the high severity issues. And these are basically all dependencies and it's showing what we need to go through. So we, you'd want to go through and especially all the high severity things you want to go through and you want to upgrade to the, the version that's not going to have these issues. And then there's also sneak code test. So before it was showing all the things in our dependencies, and now it's showing all the problems in our actual custom code that's part of this project. So that's just the same. So the first command would be stuff from this open source security panel up here. And then the second command we run was from this code security panel here. So, and we can see that there's three really important issues that we should try to make sure we fix. Another cool way to kind of find vulnerabilities is just through the web interface. So let's go to the Sneak website. I'm gonna to go to my dashboard. And it's showing that we can run Sneak Monitor here, uh, right in our here. So if I do Sneak Monitor, And it's showing a website we can go to. I'm going to copy that, copy that. Okay, now we're in here, we can actually see all these same issues, but now it's actually easier to get more information. So this is one of the our dependencies we have. And we can show more detail. It's going to show how we fix that. And then we can also actually get more information like CWE29. 
this is a path traversal issue, which is one of the things we exploited, if you can remember if you remember. So we could actually fix that issue just by upgrading to 4.11 instead of 4.7. And then if we want, we can also get more information about the library. And it goes right to the NPM website for the library. So we go down here and you can see all the things that are definitely need to get fixed. So the high priority, critical priority, and so marked. Oh yeah, I saw marked yet. Yeah. So this is another, this is one that we exploited. And if we just upgrade to marked 0.3.18, then the one where we were typing in to do items and we were able to get JavaScript into there, if we upgrade this, then that won't be a problem. We can also go here where it's suggesting very specific fixes. So def it's saying definitely upgrade these things and it's going to fix all these different issues. And then if we go here, this is just going to show all of our dependencies. And you can see if we click into here, body parser is a dependency. And inside body parser, there's another dependency, this QS here. And if we click into QS, well, this has a high severity issue. So that's something we definitely want to know about. So this is pretty great. It's a way to figure out all the security issues and all the dependencies on your on your uh, on your app uh, applications. There's no way to be able to know all these on your own. You pretty much need a tool like this to make sure your your application isn't using these these dependencies that have different vulnerabilities like this. Now, this is outside the scope of this course, but there's also a way to set up on Sneak so anytime you push your code to a repository, it's automatically going to run all these tests. And before you even merge a pull request, it will show all the security issues that could be in the, the pull request that you're trying to do. And then you can be required to fix them before you actually merge that pull request. But now we're going to talk about containers. Eric Smalling is going to teach the next part of this course about securing containers. He has a ton of experience in this area and is great at explaining everything. He'll also give another quick overview of DevSecOps. Hey everybody, Eric here. I am here to talk to you about containers and security and all the things that we have to look at now that uh, we're containerizing our applications. A little bit about myself so you know where I'm coming from. I am a software developer for the past 30 years, give or take. Uh, I am a senior developer advocate now at Sneak, a uh, software uh, a security scanning company. And um, the last decade or so of my career really have been spent more around the CI, CD, build automation tests kind of a, a world. And um, during that, I, I discovered Docker. Docker, I've been using Docker since about 2013, uh, back in the early, early days before we had any orchestrators or even Compose or anything. Uh, today, I am Docker Captain and am certified in all three of the Kubernetes certifications. It means anything to you. And uh, you can get a hold of me on, at that uh, Twitter address or LinkedIn or whatever, all the socials. So, what are we going to talk about today? First of all, we're going to get into how does security play with DevOps? Is it, is, is it a, a versus kind of a thing or do they work together? Uh, next, we'll get into what are the challenges we face specifically uh, as developers uh, making, uh, putting our apps in containers. And I'm going to get into a demonstration to show you what can happen if uh, you don't uh, look out for these kind of uh, problems. And we'll get into you know, how, how can you be proactive to avoid the, the situations you'll see in that demonstration. And finally, we'll wrap it all up at the end. So DevOps is an interesting term. It's, um, I mean, literally, it is just a, a melding of development and operations and everything else in between uh, to cooperate, to work together, and to automate things together, um, and to, to work well together. Um, unfortunately, it's turned into kind of a buzzword in our field, and it's kind of gone the way Agile did for a while there, where consultants will sell you Agile. They'll also sell you DevOps, where you have a DevOps team or DevOps tools. But really, it's more about the concept of making sure we're all working together towards fast, um, uh, repeatable builds and um, uh, making sure that everything you know is, is done well together as a team. 
And often DevOps is uh, visualized with our software delivery lifecycle pipelines. The pipeline was kind of popularized back when the continuous delivery book was written. And um, this is a simplistic pipeline uh, I'm showing here. Uh, yours may look more complicated than that, but generally you look at ideation to production from left to right, and it's like an assembly line. Um, in this diagram, I put our company's little patch logo on a couple of the blocks where we historically have seen security applied to our pipelines. In production, first of all, I mean, that's kind of table stakes. We've always had some kind of security being applied to production, whether it be firewalling or um, role-based access control, um, uh, tripwires, all the, all the things that you think of when you think of hardening for production. We've had security around that. Well, uh, we also started the security inter in when we started doing pipelines and started doing continuous delivery. We saw it applied as a stage. A security audits would happen, and usually they'd be a late stage in that pipeline because oftentimes it was a manual process and it was a, a, a gating kind of a thing where some team would go in and look at your application and determine whether or not you have... Uh, um, uh, increased your vulnerabilities or, or in, in, some, in some way made things less secure. And they would pull the cord, stop the line, and you'd have to go in and, and figure out what it was. And usually this was after functional testing, so it was like a late bug, and you now you got to put your mind back into the state of what was I doing when we worked on that code, because we moved forward since then. Um, or it could have been automated. Uh, there were automated tools uh, that have been around for a while, uh, but usually they were so slow um, or their licensing was so onerous that you could only run a few copies of it, or you could only run it on certain hardware that your CI pipeline would use. And um, so again, these would be late stage things that cause you to have to stop and figure out what happened and hopefully get a fix in quick for the release. Or unfortunately, often it would be put on the backlog for a new release you know, coming down the line and you go to production with known vulnerabilities, which is never good. As containers started to come in and we uh, modernized uh, the, the way we did security against those, you saw scanning coming in at the registry level. So you'd push an image to a, a image registry and uh, it might have a built-in scanning functionality. And uh, it would grind away for however long it took and it would come back often with just a big list of, here's all the CVEs, have fun with that. Uh, ho hopefully, um, you also had similar uh, things that were able to be done, similar kind of scanning in your CI uh, as, as your repo change. So as code is merged into the main line or whatever branching strategy you use, uh, something would kick off, do your builds, and one of the automated tests that would happen would be that um, security scan. So you'd build the image and you might be able to scan it or send it off to something to scan it even before it gets to the registry. That's kind of cool because now you can break the build without having to rely on some kind of callback from the registry to you know, break the pipeline after it's already been going. So that same kind of tool, if it's fast enough, could actually be applied pre-merge. So if you're doing Git, for instance, you have pull requests often where you have a short-lived branch and you come back into your main or master or whatever you're using. And um, you could have one of the automated tests that happens as part of the validation of that pull request be a security scan. Again, now the tool needs to be fast enough to do that because otherwise people aren't going to want to wait a day for a pull request to get reviewed. They want to get it in and be iterative and get it done. But the holy grail of this is really to get that kind of scanning capability to be so fast and so uh, useful that a developer will use it day in and day out on their workstation. Um, you want it not only to be fast, but you want the output of it to be actionable so that the developer can be proactive and not having security and, and that team be an adversarial relationship. You wanna be able to say, hey, issues have come up, here's the information I have and I can act on this information or I can at least go to the security folks and talk to them intelligently about what I'm seeing and get you know cooperation there instead of an adversarial role. And this is where we get the term DevSecOps. Now DevSecOps, in my opinion, really isn't a thing. It is more of a reminder that between dev and ops, security needs to be part of that thing. Security needs to be invited to our little DevOps party, right? They need to be um, uh, just uh, integrated, if you will. Now, I've talked about container, you know, that they're challenging. What is it that's challenging about um, containers? 
Well, for developers, you, we are increasing our scope of responsibility, sometimes greatly. This is an area where historically, you know, we dealt with securing our code and maybe the libraries we pull in, but containers are adding operating system level things, things like what base image are you using? What is it bringing along? Uh, what distribution is that base image built on? What packages are you installing on top of it? How are you installing your application? What file system permissions are you using? What uh, user ID are you using? All of that kind of stuff, uh, which we've known about as developers, but we might not have really dealt with it much because the teams that uh, deployed our software or, or built the systems that we deployed to dealt with it. Um, and so we, we have a bit of a lack of expertise around how do you harden a Linux and an Ubuntu versus a CentOS uh, file system um, distribution. Uh, these are things that other people did for us before. Now, hopefully we're working with those teams as we build our Docker files and Kubernetes YAML and everything else so that um, we're crafting these files correctly. But I need to know as a developer, if I need to tweak that file, that I'm doing it right. And I don't want to have to open a ticket every time I want to change a Docker file uh, to my ops team to say, hey, let's work together to fix this. I mean, if it's something complicated, sure. But if I'm just changing you know, what package I need for something it's got to be a better way. And on top of all of this, any security practice you add to a developer's day to day can't impact their velocity. Business has bought into and given us the ability to do these iterative CD pipelines. All it's because it's all about velocity, getting from ideation to market in front of the customer as fast as you can. We're not going to we don't want to introduce something that's going to slow that down. In fact, they'd probably really like us to be faster if we can. OK, so Let's go back to talking about what developers know about containers. Now, we, we know our applications, you know, when, when we write them, that we have to pay attention to the, the code itself. The code has to be clean. You can't be introducing in SQL injection and issues or whatever. We, we, we've got to write secure code. And we know also that our libraries need to be clean as well. Um, but what's new is these Docker files. Like I talked about, uh, we're, we're dealing with op operating system issues now. And for instance, looking at this little screenshot, I know what Python is because maybe I'm a Python programmer. And I know that version three of Python is what I'm on, but do I know what minor version this is? Do I know what Linux distribution it's on top of? Do, do I need to know? What about the packages I'm installing? And am I doing it correctly or am I installing them um, in, in a way that's putting things on the file system that doesn't need to be there? All sorts of questions like that come up. And of course, we've got infrastructure as code files like Terraform or CloudFormation. Um, and uh, the big granddaddy of them all would be Kubernetes. And this is, you know, if you're in an orchestrated container land, you're dealing with Kubernetes most likely nowadays. And this is an API that changes every three, three times a, a year and has a, a lot of knobs and switches on it. And it's very easy to make a mistake and um, cause a problem that you didn't even know you were making a mistake. It's enough to get your app running on these various technologies to make you hyperventilate. But uh, uh, hardening the app for security on top of that, well, that, that's, that's, that's a, it asking even more. Okay, so that's enough talking slides and, and hypotheticals. Let's actually look at a demonstration of this in action. So let me set the scene. Let's say we're at a company, we have a Java enterprise application that we've had running for years and years. It's, it's our big money maker. Um, but it's in a kind of maintenance phase. We're, we're not doing active development um, or anything, just bug fixes here and there. And so a couple years ago, when it was time to, you know, when containers came on the scene and, and uh, we got uh, access to Kubernetes servers, we decided, hey, we want to do that. We want to take advantage of containers and the, the, the standardized packaging and deployment mechanisms we get with the, with the orchestrator. So we lifted and shifted our Java Tomcat application into a container, and we've been running it that way ever since. So if you look at this uh, Docker file, this is a multi-stage Docker file, which means that there are multiple different from lines, and for each one of those, that's a stage. So here we have two of them. We have the initial one, which builds our application. That's uh, based on the uh, official Maven image from Docker and, and the, the Maven folks. And uh, then we have a second one that is the official Tomcat image from Apache Tomcat. And anyone who's done Tomcat for a while, then this is November of 2021 right now, and this is still 8.5.21. That's a pretty old version. 
Um, but the attitude for a lot of folks is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. This is the version we were at in production when we containerized, and we're sticking to it because we it works, and we're not making changes that need anything new. We'll look at we'll come back to that decision in a second. The rest of the file is pretty basic. It's just set up a couple of configuration files and then copy artifacts from the build stage into the main stage. So the final image we produce is Tomcat plus our application and a couple configs. So let's take a look at this running. Uh, this is the top level sample servlet that you see right here. And you can see I pulled this up so that you can see that 8521 is definitely the version we're running. Um, just to make sure our app is running, I'll pull that up. And there it is. There's a beautiful to-do list. Makes billions of dollars for us. Or so I say. Um, but honestly, the, 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 our app is not what I want to talk about today. There may be problems in it, but that's not the discussion. Let me switch hats now and put on my black hat hacker hat. Now, I may be um, looking for vulnerable servers to exploit as a hacker. And in doing that, I'll do my studies and I'll see, you know, I may be looking at Tomcat's release notes for vulnerabilities they fixed. And you can see there's a bunch of uh, fixes they've done. And throughout here, we're seeing all sorts of things. There's denial of service attacks. There's, um, oh gosh, incorrectly documented CJ, all sorts of stuff. But the one that's interesting to me are these remote code execution ones. This means that if I'm able to exploit something that has one of these vulnerabilities in it, I might be able to run my own code and somebody else's server. Pretty bad. This one we're looking at right now is uh, fixed in 8.5.23. That tells me that anyone on 8.5.22 or older might be vulnerable. And as you saw, that, that company is running 8.5.21. So I could dig into this if I go into the vulnerability database. This is Sneak's vulnerability database, very similar to MITRE. We add a few extra you know, pieces of information to it. Uh, but what's, I, I could dig into this and I could find out what is it about Tomcat Util that has issues and what, what is it there are the issues and try to craft something. But I'm in this for speed and I just want to find something quick. And I see that there's a couple of exploit DB links. I'm going to click on one. And what this is, is code. This happens to be Python code that um, I'm not a huge Python coder, but I could read this and I could tell, oh, this has got two methods. It's a proof of concept script that will check for and exploit against that CVE uh, to prove whether or not you have it or whether you're patched. So I'm going to copy that and I have a couple of, let me set this up, I forgot to do this before the call, so I'm going to run this uh, shell script. This is going to, basically it's going to take that Python script, it's going to wrap it in a container and alias it for me so it's easy to run for this demonstration. And, I'm out, and that's done. And I'm going to run the check side of that. And you can imagine this would be automated if I was really going after a bunch of servers. I might have a ton of IPs and ports that I'm ping, 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 kind of like the old war games, war dialer, going through looking for vulnerable. And I found one. That's my local IP. I'm just running this locally on a Docker Kubernetes, uh, Docker desktop Kubernetes. Um, this works any Kubernetes I want to run it on or any Docker ex uh, executable. Um, this is saying it's vulnerable and it's stuck a POC JSP onto the server. So let's jump back over here and I'm going to add POC JSP and there's a bunch of A's there. I guarantee that was not there a couple minutes ago when I showed you the site earlier. What I've done, and though the A's, that's not very nefarious really, but the ability to take a JSP and push it to somebody else's server and have it actually be there, that's pretty bad. Um, let's take a look at the other side of the script, I'm going to run the pwn side, which will inject a different JSP out there. If I pull that one up, I've got a nice little form. I just ran env on a shell, basically, but in the environment that the Tomcat server is running in. And I can look at this, I'm going to shrink it a little bit here, and I can see, oh, there's my Java home, there's a bunch of information, and oh, look at that, there's Kubernetes port. That means most likely I am running in a Kubernetes server, which means most likely I'm on a container D or Docker uh, container. And that's interesting. That's the API server from the point of view of the pod that I'm in. So if I wanted to, maybe I could start tickling the control plane of the Kubernetes cluster I'm in and seeing if there's anything available to me. In order to do that, I'd need kubectl or it'd be easier if I had kubectl, I don't need it, but it'd be easier. And it doesn't look like I have that. Do I have curl? 
Uh, let's just do curl help. I do. So I've got curl at my disposal. Now I'm not gonna go through in this demonstration hacking a Kubernetes cluster, but I will show you a couple other things. Um, ooh, I'm root. So that's nice. That means I can do things like, um, oops, let me get in the field, ls, ltr, etc password, and oops, not ls, ltr, that, that's not interesting. This is more interesting, uh, etc password. Now I'm in a container. So these users aren't that interesting to me, but it is, I, I can get at them, I can see them. What, what can I do, what else can I do? Can I do this, touch etc foo? And let's see if that works. Go to the bottom. And sure enough, I was able to create a file in the etc top level directory on this uh, container. That's because I'm root and I have write access everywhere in this container. That means I could go into the other web app, the to-do list, and I can modify it. I could also go change out things in the JVM itself. I have curl. And if I have external network access, I can bring down my own scripts. I can bring down my own JVM that has maybe other code baked into it. But honestly, most, most of the time what's going to happen now, if I'm, I'm root on a writable file system container, I'm going to download, and I have curl and or some other tool, I can, I'm going to download a script that starts with crypto mining or something and use up all the CPU I can on this node. So that's interesting. And hopefully, you know, in a real server, the production intrusion detection or other alerts are going off now because I'm doing things that shouldn't be happening. But we don't really want to just have a reactionary posture to this. How could I as a developer have proactively avoided this situation or uh, dealt with even unknown vulnerabilities that might be out there? Let's take a look at that. So I'm going to go back over here to my shell, kill out of this. Now I've already built this image locally. Let's, let's imagine I'm, I'm the developer working on this application at some point and I'm building locally to check a bug fix I did or whatever. And I've built my image so that I can run it somewhat similar to the way it would run in production. And um, what I can do though is before or during that process, I can go ahead <clears throat> and run, I'm gonna run our scanning tool. There's a lot of different scanning tools out there. Um, I'm gonna run the one that I know the best, which is Sneaks. Uh, I'm gonna do container test and the image name is java goof tag one and i'm also going to feed a uh, metadata into this command uh, where i say file is docker file that lets it know that this is the docker file that built that image which gives it a little more information about it so it can kind of correlate what's in the layers and what the base images and all that kind of information. So the tool, you know, depending on what scanner you use, the way this one's working is it's, it's ripping through all the different layers of the image, looking at all the packages that are installed, looking at the base image, and then it's gonna go start querying the uh, vulnerability database on the internet uh, for the very latest vulnerability lists and come up with compare, you know, letting you know what's in this image and what vulnerabilities might be there for uh, the given versions of everything that's installed. So as this goes, we see that here it goes querying the vulnerability database. <clears throat> and there we go. So we could go up here and we could take a look at uh, this list of all the different things that went wrong or that are, could go wrong, such as this, uh, uh, there's libcurl has a bunch of vulnerabilities and it's saying if I were to upgrade libcurl to that version, we could get you know get past those, but honestly, the more interesting thing when it deals when dealing with containers, from my point of view, is down here at the bottom where we're saying, "Hey, you are on base image eight five twenty one of Tomcat, which we know has sixty six critical and one hundred and eighty eight high vulnerabilities, six hundred and thirty five total. If you simply upgraded to a newer version of Tomcat, and this changes every time I run it because the vulnerability database is constantly changing, um, it's saying if you went to this version." You would drop to 122 total vulnerabilities, four high, eight, or sorry, four critical, and 18 high. If you were willing to upgrade to a newer version of Tomcat uh, family into the Tomcat nines, you could get even less. And then if you were willing to actually go to a whole different JVM, this is the Amazon Coretto JVM, I do believe, um, you could actually eliminate all known vulnerabilities. So at this point, even as a junior developer who doesn't know squat about Tomcat itself and, and, and the image, the base image that it's coming from, I have some good information. I, I, I know that, you know, I've got this many vulnerabilities and I, and I can have some 
quick hit fixes, and I can go to my lead engineer and maybe my AppSec person say, hey, here's what I'm seeing. Which of these makes the most sense uh, to go to? And, you know, just putting the hat of the, the architect, I, mm, well, you know, we can't really run on Tomcat 9 yet because we depend on things in 8.5, so that's not really an option. And I am not ready to drink the, the Kool-Aid of, of the new uh, Coretto JVM. So let's at least move to, to a newer version of Tomcat uh, in the 8.5 family. Let's go to this one. And we'll take a look at what vulnerabilities are there and see if we have mitigating concerns or if maybe they're, they're not, we're, we're not using that piece of code that's in them. Um, but but I can, we can take an educated path towards repairing vulnerabilities and, get, and getting past them. I'm not going to go through the trouble of rebuilding this all and showing you. I just guarantee that if, if I rebuilt with that and tried to do the hack I just did, it, it won't work because the vulnerability has been fixed. Let's talk a little bit about uh, what about vulnerabilities that we don't know about, that the, the, the analysts have not found. Zero days, things that people are holding on to for bug bounties, whatever. Uh, how would I deal with that? Because a scanner is not going to know that. Well, that brings us to a conversation about defense in depth. This is good for both known and unknown vulnerabilities. These are practices that make it harder for bad actors to take advantage of your systems. Um, they're good all the time. So there's three areas I'm going to touch on. The image, the runtime, and then some Kubernetes specifics. When it comes to the image, number one thing that we recommend is to minimize your footprint. And you saw me doing that a bit when I used a multi-stage build prior. Uh, that's good because I'm not including Maven or the source code of my application in that final image. But we could minimize it even further. There's no reason my application should have curl available. It doesn't use it, doesn't need it. So we should get rid of that. And the best way to get rid of things like that is to use a smaller base image first. Um, in the Tomcat world, there are tags that have the word slim on the end, and this is true of many base images. And these are built on um, in a way that are, are, they carve it down to just what you need to run a Tomcat app. Now, it may not be enough for your application, in which case you might have to add a package or two to it and you'll have to manage that. But generally, if you're just running a JEE application and you're not doing anything fancy, these slim versions are a good choice. There's even further slimming you can do by going to, say, the Google open source uh, distro list uh, base images. There's uh, some, th these have just, like the Java one just has a open JDK JVM and nothing else that's not needed to run that. There's no shell. There's no package manager, none of that. And that, that's really secure. It makes it a little harder to support uh, if you're not used to using modern tools. If you're wanting the exec in, that's not going to happen because you don't have a shell to exec to, right? Um, you need to understand how layers are built and the, the housekeeping around that. So we couldn't just do an, a run RM curl, for instance, to get rid of curl. It would hide it from the container's file system but a savvy hacker that gets access to the root file system through other means, whether it be a bind mount or something, um, can still find those layers because it's just hidden. It's just marked as deleted. Not It's still in the prior layers. And all of those layers exist in the container runtime file system. Uh, so just understand how layers work and how they're built and how to optimize for, uh, for your running builds. And um, build strategies. So multi-stage is, is a strategy for doing your builds. It's a good one to use. There's other tools you can use, though, and other practices. You want to make sure your builds are repeatable so that every time you pull the same commit out of source code, you get the same image constructed from it. And you can do this by making sure you pick specific tags on images. You can even put a, a, a SHA hash into that image, uh, into that from line, and you'll get, you're will get you guaranteed to get that image. That adds some other complexities. Uh, people have blogged about the pros and cons of that. But at least use a specific image of a, um, a version, like Tomcat uh, 8568 or 71 or 7, whatever is better than 85 because 85 or 8 is a moving target that will go to an, the latest build every time you, you, you pull it. There's things like Docker labels you could, you could use to add metadata to your image to the image itself that's not used at runtime, but you could use it for fact finding about what's in an image. Um, and there are other tools. Uh, in the Java world, there's Jib, which is a great tool for building images that doesn't need a container engine at all to build the image. There's, if you're in the Red Hat uh, environment, you've got Builda and, and the Podman suite of tools. Um, and, and Kyverno, or not Kyverno, sorry, <laughs> and Canico, and uh, so many names getting mixed up. Uh, then we also have uh, the secure supply chain. Now, entire conferences are built around this topic nowadays. But what I want to, you know, kind of hit on is the, the the fact that you need to know where your images come from. 
Don't just be deploying anything. And Eric Smalling building an image on his laptop, that image should never get to a production server because you have no idea where it came from, what it was put into it. You don't have a chain of custody. You don't know where it's been and how, who's touched it along the way. Um, if you're interested, go look into things like SigStore and, and uh, the um, uh, work towards uh, software bill of materials and things like that are, are, are quite uh, the topic right now. Uh, nowhere near enough time to talk about that here. When we get to runtime, this is where the real meat of this comes to. Uh, you can make sure your containers don't run as root. Uh, you can use a user line on, on the command line or in Kubernetes, there's a setting for that. Uh, you can make sure that they're running as something else. In fact, you can specify in your Docker file, the default user is X. Do that. Running as root is dangerous. Even though you're in a container, as you saw, I was UID zero, so I could modify any file in that container. Also, if somebody, heaven forbid, were to bind mount a host volume into that container, I'm UID zero there too, so I can read and write to host files that are mounted in, depending on the mount, how it's done. Privileged containers you should never use unless you're doing something really low level like um, Kubernetes monitor monitoring software or uh, writing a CNI plugin, a network plugin. Um, generally, this gives you root access to devices on the host system, and it's just a terrible thing to, to give it just more, most applications. Um, Linux capabilities, these are features of the Linux kernel the system calls that your process can make to do things that are a little bit escalated, but not quite root. Um, Ping has netcap add to, to in order to create IC, ICMP packets, for instance, things like that. Um, the, the, the early Docker teams uh, and, and other container engine teams whittled down the, 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 a good set, a, 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 a small set of these that most applications should be able to live with, but business applications and stuff that a lot of people work on day to day don't need any of them because you're not doing network low level stuff and, and whatnot. So I would, I, I like to drop all capabilities and then just, just add back any that I might need. And there are blogs written and all sorts of, of information, just Google for it on how to find out what capabilities you need. You can use tools like S-Trace or Falco to dig into it. Next, we have the read-only root file system. This, uh, when you start a container up, the container engine basically takes all the layers of the image, uh, which are read-only, compiles those up, creates the virtual file system that the process sees, but then it adds another read-write layer on top. And any modifications to the file system are done in that read-write layer. If you change a file that's in the image, it basically does a copy-on-write, brings it up to the read-write layer, and then makes the modification there. Any new files get created there as well. You can, however, start, this is the default mode. You can start the container without that read-write layer, effectively making it a read-only file system. This is very, very good if you can do it. If your application can run in that mode, do it. This is, makes it immutable, which is one of the 12 factors, which we should all be aiming for in container land anyway. Um, if your app needs to write things to persist to disk temporarily, ephemerally, like a Tomcat server, to use that example again, has the work directory and some logs and things, uh, use the, um, a tempfs, like uh, the Kubernetes empty dir, and mount that path just for that, and it'll get, it's a, it'll get thrown away when the container gets destroyed. Um, or mount an external volume and make sure you set permissions correctly for, you know, securely for that. But don't, um, if you can at all not run in, in read-write mode, that can greatly enhance security. Many of the things you saw me starting to hack at and talk about if it was read-only, it would have been very hard for me to do. Bitcoin mining, for instance, on a read-only file system would require me to be able to pipe, like, curl down my script and pipe it. It would just be harder to do, and I'd have no local cache to store things in, and it just, it's, it's a great tool to, to make it harder for the hacker. Deploying from known sources, this kind of calls back to what I said before about secure supply chain. Just make sure you know where your images come from. Don't be deploying from the internet. You should probably have your own registry, uh, whether it's a mirror or you know your own uh, hosted cool. registry. Um, use that. And then finally, if you're running on Kubernetes, and many of you probably are, there are tools that Kubernetes adds that you should take a look at. For instance, secrets. If you have credentials or other sensitive information, do not build it into your image. Do not include it in a flat file that you just uh, you know bind mount in. Don't use config maps. None of those are secure. Secrets can be secure. 
Uh, they by make sure your cluster admin is encrypting those secrets at rest because by default they're not. You have to do that if you're rolling your own Kubernetes clusters. Um, but if they are, secrets allow you to have your own role-based access control applied to them and it, it keeps things nice and clean and separate. Speaking of role-based access control, RBAC, use it, learn it. it. It can be a little complicated and hard to understand at first, but learn the ins and outs of it and uh, you'll be happy that you did. Security context. This is the specification for the pods and containers in Kubernetes that implement a lot of the things I talked about on the prior slide. Things like running with a read-only root file system, running as non, you know, changing the, the user you're running as and, and enforcing to not be root. Things like that are, impl uh, are implemented in Kubernetes through the security context, and you should learn about those and use those. Network policies are critical. Uh, many developers get all worked up about network policy. They think it's very complicated. It's really not. It's just all about setting rules about what pods can talk to each other and what can't, on, and on what protocol, TCP or UDP and whatnot, and, you know, ports and all that. I'm a big fan of, of the zero trust pattern, which is no pods can talk to any pod, no, any other pod, except for what I explicitly put in an allow list. So nobody can talk to anybody except my pods in the front end namespace can talk to the business tier labeled pods on port 8080 TCP. So that traffic specifically is allowed, but other traffic between front ends or own isn't. And uh, you should look into that. If you do that, make sure you open up um, egress traffic to your DNS, because if you don't, then you have no service lookup and that crashes everything uh, pretty much. And finally, all of these things I'm talking about, enforce them. Use a tool like OPA Gatekeeper or Kyverno. Um, there's also pod security policies, which is deprecated and gonna be replaced by pod security admission, but that's still in beta as of 1.23. If you're watching this when pod security admission is out of beta, you know, by all means, use it. But use any kind of these tools to make sure that deployments that break the rules, the policies that your organization uses, can't be deployed. Um, and just just do it. <laughs> it's a, it's it, it simplifies life, and if you apply it across all of your environments, then a developer won't be surprised by the fact that you know in production I can't deploy as root. What? Because I haven't been able to deploy as root on any of our clusters. So it's just a common rule set that I've used everywhere. So the key takeaways from today's talk. Um, the feedback loop is critical. Just like when CI you know, came on the scene and became the big buzzword, letting me know that the build was broken as fast as possible. That feedback, that fast feedback loop enables continuous integration. Well, it's the same thing with security. Finding out that I've added security vulnerabilities or somehow weakened my security posture of my application on my own workstation, that's that's critical. Having that fast feedback is 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 great because I can fix it now while it's still fresh in my mind of what I've just did. And it didn't get out and you know cause impact to other people. Secondly, the whatever tool you end up using for scanning and, and whatnot, make sure that it allows you to be proactive. It gives you good information that allows you to attack now rather than just scratch your head and say, well, I have no idea what this means. Make sure that it's giving you good, proactive, actionable information. And then finally, practice defense in depth. There's always going to be new vulnerabilities that nobody knows about, except that that one hacker that found it. And if you make it harder on the hacker's life, they'll move on to somebody that's an easier ta target. That's just how it is. So I want to thank you for uh, watching. Secure your containers, guys. Thanks. We've reached the end. You should now have a better understanding of DevSecOps and be able to start implementing some new security tools in your workflow. Check out the description for additional resources. And thanks for watching.